will be in Jonah this morning, beginning our series in Jonah. I'm excited about this. Jonah chapter 1. Before we uh, open up with uh, reading Jonah chapter 1, I wonder if any of you know who it is that wrote the song Amazing Grace. Remember the name? John Newton, that's right. Yeah, John Newton. Uh, Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Wonderful song that we all know. You know, John Newton, he had uh, quite a history of troubles at sea. You can kind of see some parallels still with, with, uh, with John Newton and, and Jonah. So as a young man, John Newton was... Uh, Captured, he was pressed into naval service, so he was, he was forced to serve in the Navy. Um, a very unpleasant experience for him. Uh, at one point, he even considered jumping overboard. Eventually, he was left behind with a slave dealer in Africa because he wasn't getting along with, with the people on the ship. And so uh, he was basically a slave for a few years uh, there with this slave dealer. And then... Uh, um, finally, after being rescued and once again being at sea, um, uh, we uh, learn about his conversion. It was in the midst of a violent storm, right? So he's, so he's now on a ship once again in the midst of a violent storm, and he calls out to God and is saved. And so uh, we see with both John Newton and Jonah, we see uh, salvation on the sea in the midst of a storm. I've got to put in my alliteration there, right? Um, but uh, so, so we see some parallels, don't we? Uh, Jonah truly is about salvation. Um, we, see, we see the gospel in a very clear way in the book of Jonah. So I've titled this series, The Gospel According to Jonah. So of course we have the gospels in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, um, or the longer version would be the gospel according to Matthew, the gospel according to Mark, and so on. Um, and so I'm calling this the gospel according to Jonah because we do truly see the gospel, the message of salvation here in Jonah. And so uh, that's, that's a very exciting thing to see. Uh, and really, whenever we're looking at any Old Testament book, I think it's important that we, that we seek to find Christ in it because uh, all of Scripture points in some way to Christ. I think we see that in some very clear ways in Jonah. So the title of the series is The Gospel According to Jonah. Uh, the title of this message is A Sovereign and Saving God. So before we read uh, Jonah, one more thing, just a little bit of background. Jonah, uh, this story took place um, in, in uh, probably about 780 to 5, 753 B.C. That probably doesn't mean much to you, but we'll, we'll put it here on the biblical timeline. This, this is during the time of the divided kingdom. And so it's between, right, so we have uh, Saul and David and Solomon. Um, we, have, we have their reigns. Uh, to begin with, and then, uh, and then after that, the kingdom divides, and we have the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. We have this period where there's kings of the north and kings of the south. Uh, Israel uh, is the name of the northern kingdom. The nor northern kingdom retained the name Israel, the southern kingdom, Judah. And so between these three great kings uh, of, of Israel, and, then, and between the time of that and um, the Babylonian captivity, where we read the stories of like Daniel, the lion's den, the story of Esther, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, um, that's, that's the time of the divided kingdom. And that's the time in which uh, Jonah is uh, taking place. Okay? And, uh, and of course, Jonah, he's told to go to Nineveh. Nineveh is the capital of Assyria. And uh, Assyria comes up later in biblical history. In fact, the Assyrians invade the northern kingdom. Uh, the book of Nahum is actually um, written concerning Nineveh and Assyria at large. So that's just some historical details. But let's, let's now look at uh, Jonah chapter 1. And let's pray before we do. Lord, we, uh, we thank you for your word. And we thank you that the gospel can be found throughout your word in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. Help us to see that. Help us to see Christ this morning. Open our eyes. Open our ears. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, 
Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went on board to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship threatened to break up. Then the mariners were afraid, and each cried out to his God. And they hurled the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the ship, and had lain down, and was fast asleep. So the captain came and said to him, What do you mean, you sleeper? Arise, call out to your God. Perhaps the God will give a thought to us, that we may not perish. And they said to one another, Come, let us cast lots, so that we may know on whose account this evil has come upon us. And so they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. They said to him, Tell us on whose account this evil has come upon us. What is your occupation? Where do you come from? What is your country? Of what people are you? And he said to them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, What is this that you have done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord, because he had told them. Then he said to them, what shall we do? Sorry, they said to him, What shall we do that the sea may quiet down for us? For the sea grew more and more tempestuous. He said to them, Pick me up and hurl me into the sea, and the sea will quiet down for you. For I know that it is because of me that this great tempest has come upon you. Nevertheless, the men rowed hard to get back to dry land, but they could not, for the sea grew more and more tempestuous. Uh, <laughs> That's a tough word, isn't it? It, 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 got, it got really bad. <laughs> Therefore they called out to the Lord, O oh Lord, let us not perish for this man's life, and, let us not, and lay not on us his innocent blood. For you, O oh Lord, have done, it, has done, it, have done as you pleased. And so they picked up Jonah, and they hurled him into the sea. And the sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly. And they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. So three points in the sermon. Um, we see Jonah's disobedience. We see the sovereignty of God. And we see uh, God's desire for salvation um, for, uh, for people. Let's begin first with Jonah's disobedience. Jonah here gives us a classic example of what not to do. All right? God tells him to go to Nineveh. And where does he go? Not to Nineveh. Have any of you seen the, the Jonah Veggie Tales? Anybody? Ah, oh, okay. We've got, we've got a few who will admit it. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so Veggie Tales... You know, they'll do uh, little Bible, Bible stories sometimes, and uh, one of them is Jonah. It's kind of funny. Uh, I, I remember, it's been a while since I've seen it, but uh, I remember uh, when Jonah um, is getting on the ship, there's one sign that says Nineveh, and there's a sign that says not Nineveh. <laughs> and he follows a sign that says not Nineveh. Um, and, of course, uh, this is Tarshish. So he, he gives us a classic example of what not to do, right? He, he directly disobeys God. And, and yet... Uh, as, as, as crazy as this seems, we can be guilty of the same thing, can't we? Just, just to uh, disobey God in, in very direct ways. Now, now there's a difference here. Um, we're not prophets like Jonah. So it's not so much that God speaks to us in the way that he spoke to Jonah. Um, and we don't even know exactly how it is that God spoke to Jonah, right? If, if it was through some audible voice or if it was, if it was through some kind of inward um, communication or, or what. Um, but, uh, but of course, he had uh, this special relationship with God as a prophet through which God spoke directly to him. Um, how, do, how does God tend to speak to us today, though? He speaks to us through his word, right? Now, God might give us impressions, and, and, and we, want, we want to follow the, the leading of the Holy Spirit. But, of course, there is a difference between us and Jonah. Um, but, but still, we, we, have, we have God's word here, which is, which is ever so clear. And, and so often we directly disobey God's word. Um, and here's something funny that, that people will do sometimes. Sometimes Christians might say, well, I know that the Bible says this, but I feel like God wants me to do this. 
Um, well, no, it doesn't, doesn't, doesn't work that way. Um, God's word is written for us um, very clearly uh, so that we are to obey it. And so, uh, um, so it's important for us to obey what God commands, isn't it? It's important that Jonah obeyed what God commanded him, um, and he did not, and, uh, and so often we do not. I think a key thing that we see here in this passage, though, is that obedience is for our good, and disobedience only drags us down and away from the Lord. So consider your own life and uh, times in which you might uh, be tempted to disobey God's word and, uh, and not follow as, as, as he has commanded. Um, it's, uh, it's not for your good. And, and maybe you can look back at your life and, and even see instances in which you disobeyed the Lord and it only dragged you down. I think there's uh, something very intentional here in, in the wording in, in verses 1 through 6. Um, we see again and again uh, the command for Jonah to arise, but instead Jonah goes down. Okay, I'm going to read. I'm going to read this again. I'm going to emphasize these words, and I think you'll see that there's. Uh, I think there's something intentional going on. That's. I think it's a beautiful thing about the scriptures. When we dig a little bit deeper into the scriptures, sometimes we can see like some really neat things that the authors uh, are doing that uh, we might not see when just looking at it on the surface. So, so, so listen to this as I emphasize these words. Now the, Lord, now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amatai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. And so he paid the fare and went on board to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. Notice also away from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship threatened to break up. Then the mariners were afraid, and each cried out to his God, and they hurled up the cargo that was on the ship into the sea to lighten the load for them. But Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the ship and had lain down and was fast asleep. And so the captain came and said to him, What do you mean, you sleeper? Arise! Call out to God! Perhaps the God will give a thought to us that we may not perish." You see that? This theme of, of arise and going down? Um, we, uh, we, of course, are called to obey God's commands. And again, when we don't, it only drags us down and it drags us away from the presence of the Lord. In fact, we ourselves are fleeing from the presence of the Lord, as we see Jonah doing here. And so, so we, we, want, um, we want to have God's blessings upon our lives. We want, we want to honor God in the way that we live. We, we want to recognize that um, obedience is for our good. And, uh, and so, uh, and so that's, uh, that's key. That's key here. Now, we also need to recognize that obedience is not only for our good, but it's also for the good of others. And it's for the glory of God, ultimately. Right? We are to obey God not only for our good, but for the good of others and for the glory of God. And so in Jonah's case, uh, it was for the good of the Ninevites, right? Um, and, and it was also a way in which God would receive much glory. Um, but uh, Jonah disobeys. And we see, though, that um, in Jonah, that at least for the good of others and for the glory of God, and I think ultimately also for the good of Jonah, um, God actually, in a sense, forces him into submission, right? Even though Jonah disobeys, God makes sure that he gets to where he needs to go. And you all, you know the story, right? Uh, spoiler alert, the, the big fish is going to take him to Nineveh. Okay? Um, so, uh, so God, uh, God, God makes a way. And that, that leads us to the second point, the sovereignty of God. So we see, see first that, that Jonah was disobedient and, uh, and talk about all that that entails. But we see the sovereignty of God in many ways in this story. Um, now, the sovereignty of God is a good thing, right? It's, it's something that should bring us great comfort. Uh, you might be going through you know, things in your life and, and, and you think, okay, God is in control. I don't have to worry. God is in control. Right? That can bring us great comfort. But the sovereignty of God can also bring us great discomfort, um, like being in the belly of, belly of a fish for three days, right? Um, it can bring us great discomfort. That is, if, if we are disobedient, uh, 
and, um, and God nevertheless uh, forces us in the way that he wants us to go. Now, that's not to say that even when we're obedient, uh, we might go through some very, very trying times. But we know that ultimately it's all for our good, and it's for the good of others, and it's for the glory of God. Um, but sometimes the sovereignty of God, um, it can, it can uh, make things difficult for us. That is, especially if we have tried to go the other way. So we see that God is determined to use Jonah to bring his message to Nineveh. He's determined to do whatever it takes. Now, God probably, I mean, he could have used somebody else, but he wants to use Jonah. Jonah disobeys, but God takes matters into his own hands. So we see in verse 4, right, this, this great storm, mighty tempest on the sea, uh, comes about. And it's God's doing, right? God, it says, God, the Lord, Yahweh, um, hurled a great wind upon the sea. And then in verse 17, um, after Jonah is thrown overboard, who is it that appoints? The, it's the Lord, Yahweh. By the way, remember, when you see, when you see the Lord in all caps in, in your Bible, that's God's personal name for, um, for the um, Israelites. Yahweh, I am that I am. Um, and so, uh, so it's Yahweh that appoints this great fish. And that's important. I, I think it's important, especially in this text, because remember the... Um, the other people on the ship, you know, they, they worship all kinds of gods. They're from this polytheistic culture. And so, you know, God, the God of Israel is not just some God. This is Yahweh, uh, the God who made the sea and the dry land. We'll get to that. Um, we see that, uh, that God is sovereign, though, um, in, in the storm, pointing the fish. We see that uh, sometimes people just have to learn the hard way, right? Uh, and again, that might be something that, uh, that we might be able to testify to. Um, sometimes uh, we just have to learn the hard way. If we go against God's will, and yet he brings us to where he needs us to be anyway. Sometimes it's not pleasant. The major point here is that God is sovereign. And Jonah, he's not the only one that sees that God is sovereign, right? Jonah certainly sees it uh, in the fact that he, he went the opposite way uh, that God wanted him to go. And now we have this great storm, and now he's in the belly of a fish. Uh, he knows that God is in control, right? He knows that this is the work of God. He's not the only one. Um, let's think about these other people on the ship. So I mentioned these, these men on the ship. Uh, they come from this polytheistic culture. Um, they, they knew something strange was going, going on right away. Right? When, this, when this storm just comes out of nowhere, they know that this isn't just a natural occurrence. Right? I mean, it, it just came like that. And so, so from the very beginning, they, they start to figure out, okay, you know, what's going on? Whose account is this taking place? You know, what, what God can we call out to? Um, they, uh, they knew something was going on, so they begin to cast lots right, to, to see who the lot fell upon. And uh, the, the lot falls upon Jonah. I think we can see that as a sovereign work of God. And, uh, and we come to verse 9. Uh, after it falls on Jonah, they ask, they ask Jonah, you know, okay, what's up, Jonah? You know, who are you? Where are you from? And here's what Jonah says in verse 9. He says, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, Yahweh. All right, this is my God, Yahweh. I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Now, that's also important. Uh, not only his use of Yahweh, but the God who made the sea and the dry land. He's pointing out that God, this, this God of the Hebrews, Yahweh, is Lord over all. He, is, he created all that exists, and therefore he has power over everything. And so, uh, so it's... it's uh, it's made very clear that it's uh, because of God that this storm has come about. And so the, um, well, first, let's, let's talk about Jesus for a second. Um, I, think we, I think we see this same power in Jesus, God the Son, in the New Testament, right? Jesus calms the storm. Who has power over something like the sea and, 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 and the weather? These you know, especially in the Bible, we see that the sea is, is something that uh, represents uh, chaos, something that is uh, uncontrollable, something that is very dangerous. Um, I mean, for someone to have control over the sea, 
the storms of the sea, that's incredible. And yet Jesus, we see he calms the storm um, just, just, just with a word. So this Jesus is the same God that we read about here in Jonah. And so the response of these men on the ship is that they're uh, exceedingly afraid. They're very scared. Um, and they, uh, they follow Jonah's instructions to throw him off the ship. Now, first, they seek to row back ashore. They don't want blood on their hands. Uh, but eventually they know, okay, this, this is what we must do. Jonah has, has told them. they got to throw him overboard. So they throw Jonah overboard. And then uh, look at verse 16. After this, the storm ceases. Verse 16, then the men feared the Lord exceedingly, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. We see here that God is worthy of the fear, reverence, and worship of all people. Of all people. Um, it's an incredible uh, how, how it came about that these men saw this awesome display of God's sovereignty. You know, we, we, don't, we don't know for sure what happened to these men. Um, we don't know if this is, you know, a true conversion to worshiping um, Yahweh. I mean, you know, after all, they were polytheistic, so maybe they just kind of added uh, the God of uh, the Hebrews onto their list of gods. Um, we, we don't know for sure. Um, may, maybe, maybe there was a genuine turning to the Lord. Uh, but whatever the case, uh, we see that, that they were affected. And we see that, uh, um, that, uh, that God was able to exercise his sovereignty in, in, a, in, a, in another way here. Right? So we talk about God having control over the sea and over, and over the fish and all that. Think about this. Jonah had disobeyed God and got on this ship going the other direction. And yet God can even use our disobedience to bring glory to himself, right? If Jonah wasn't on that ship, then all this wouldn't have happened, and these men wouldn't have seen the, the power of God in the way that they did. So God can, that's, that's no reason for us to disobey, but God can even use our disobedience um, to uh, bring glory to himself. It's pretty incredible. And so, uh, so just another way that we see God's sovereignty here in Jonah. We don't only see God's sovereignty, but we see um, salvation, like God's heart for salvation here in the book of Jonah. So this leads us to the third point. Now again, we're not sure about the men on the ship. We don't, we don't know um, the state of their souls. Um, could be that God brought salvation to them, but God, God brought salvation in at least a couple of other ways. First of all, the fish, right? That is, God saved Jonah from death. Right? I mean, he was thrown into the sea. He was sure to die. But then this fish that God appoints comes and swallows him up. And this is a supernatural thing, something that, that God orchestrated. And, and, and it's, it's saving Jonah um, in a temporal way, nonetheless. But, but still, um, it's, uh, he's, he's saved from death. And then where does the fish take him? Well, it takes him to Nineveh, where God wanted him to go all along uh, to save the Ninevites from destruction. Right? Because of their sin, God was going to destroy them, but he wanted them to be warned and, uh, and, uh, and, and wanted them to repent and turn from their sin. See, the God of salvation. Um, now, it's important for us to remember why it is that Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh in the first place. And that's, uh, we can see this in chapter 4. So, here's another spoiler alert. Um, the people of Nineveh, they do repent. Now, it seems like a, a, sh a short-lived repentance because, uh, you know, later on the Assyrians invade Israel and, and then Nahum is, is written against, uh, against uh, Nineveh, the capital of Assyria. Um, and so, and so they, they cause trouble later on. Uh, however, Jesus, uh, and we'll read this passage later, but Jesus actually indicates that there was some kind of um, true repentance here. And I think we see it here in, in, in Jonah. Um, they, they turned. They turned from their wickedness, and God relented. God did not destroy them because they had turned from their ways. And listen to what Jonah says in uh, chapter 4, verses 1 through 2. This is why he didn't want to go to Nineveh in the, in the first place. It says, It displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry, and he prayed to the Lord and said, 
O oh Lord, is it not this is not this what I said when I was in my country? That that is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish, for I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. That's that's why he didn't want to go to Nineveh, because he knew that God was merciful, that God was gracious. And, and, and he was afraid that God would relent and not destroy Nineveh, right? He hated, he hated Nineveh. I mean, they're a big rival. Um, he didn't want God to um, give them mercy. A couple of interesting things uh, to observe from this. First is that um, God's character here is, is a no-brainer to Jonah. I mean, you know, Jonah, he knew from the get-go that, that God is merciful, God is gracious, slow to anger, with steadfast love, relenting from disaster. And, you know, Jonah, Jonah knew this. It was, it was just a given. God's character was a no-brainer to him. And here's why I think that's important, because today, I think many people, even, even some Christians, can have a very skewed perspective of how God is portrayed in the Old Testament. Um, a lot of times people kind of see this disconnect from the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament. Oh, the God of the Old Testament was full of wrath and anger, and he was just this, this uh, mean, mean God. And then we have the God of grace and love in, in the New Testament. Um, well, yes, there's, there's some wrath in the Old Testament. There's also some wrath mentioned in the New Testament, especially when you're referring to the Second Coming. Um, but, but we see that... The overall picture that is given of God in the Old Testament is not that he's this, this mean and angry God full of wrath, but that he is um, merciful and gracious and that he is steadfast love. He's relenting from disaster. So we see it here in Jonah. It's a no-brainer to him. And we see it throughout the Old Testament. Um, but there, there are a lot of, first of all, there are a lot of non-Christians who, who, who challenge the Bible and say, oh, the God of the Old Testament, he's just terrible. He's vindictive and he's... Um, he, he's, he's just this terrible monster. Um, and sometimes, again, even Christians can have this idea. But, um, but we see here that God, uh, in the Old Testament, as well as the New Testament, is full of love and mercy and grace. He, he has so much patience. Right? We think about the, the Canaanites, um, whom God used Israel to, to come against when they came in and took the Promised Land. Uh, God actually waited some time because their iniquity was not yet to its fullness. Um, he, uh, he, he had great patience before he finally brought destruction upon them. And so here with Nineveh, um, God's desire is for them to turn and repent. And that's what happens. And, and he, uh, and he um, relents from destroying them. So we see God's character here. But second, um, interestingly, it's Jonah. And this, this kind of goes hand in hand with the first point. Jo it's, it's Jonah who prefers destruction over repentance and salvation. It's Jonah that, that, not God, it's Jonah that wants them to be destroyed. He prefers that over repentance and salvation. So this is another example of how not to be, right? So he already gave us one example in that we, we shouldn't uh, just directly disobey God's commands. It's, it's not for our good, it's not for the good of others, it's not for the glory of God. Um, we shouldn't disobey the Lord, but we also see here that uh, we, uh, we need to have the same heart that God does and want people to, to repent, to be saved, not to be destroyed. Now, we haven't always had a good parallel here, but I think, I think maybe we do now with ISIS. Let's think about ISIS for a minute. Very, very wicked. Um, would you prefer... Let's think about all these terrorists from ISIS. Would you prefer... That they repent, that they turn from their wicked ways and are saved? Or would you just prefer, prefer God to destroy them? You know, that, that's maybe a good test of the heart. Now, I will say that for those who do not repent of their sin, God is right to bring about judgment. And, and even though we should still be grieved because we want all people to be saved, um, we can acknowledge that God's justice is good. That is, when people refuse to repent... But, but our desire should be that, that people repent and, and that they're saved. Even, even a terrible group like ISIS, right? Um, you want them to repent, turn to the Lord and be saved? Or would you prefer that they are just destroyed? I think that's kind of a good parallel. You know, uh, Jonah 
he, he, uh, he didn't like the Ninevites, and for good reason. They were very, very wicked. And he just preferred that God would destroy them rather than um, allow them to uh, repent and to um, be saved from this destruction. So we see that God is um, a God of salvation, and uh, he has a heart for saving. And we'll close here with a bigger picture. Um, tell me, how many days was it that Jonah was, was in the fish? Three. Three. All right. Well, that's important. Um, turn with me real quickly to uh, Matthew. Matthew chapter 12. And we might talk a little bit next week about uh, the whole, you know, God being in a fish for three days. Uh, that's, that sounds kind of unbelievable. We've, talk, we, we've already uh, mentioned that this is an act of God. So that, um, may, maybe that's sufficient, but maybe we'll talk about that a little bit more. Because some people have a hard time believing in um, a story like this. But uh, there's a direct connection made uh, with Christ. And... Uh, and we see that it's a very important story because of this. So Matthew 12, beginning in verse 38. Then some of the scribes and Pharisees answered Jesus, saying, Teacher, we wish to see a sign from you. But he answered them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, something greater than Jonah is here. So again, we see, we see the Old Testament pointing to Christ. Now, we see it generally in, in the themes of salvation um, in Jonah, but, but, but very specifically here in the, the three days in the fish, three days in the grave, in the heart of the earth, right? Uh, that, that direct connection is made. Um, there's a comparison, but, but just as with, all, just with all, all comparisons, Christ is superior, right? Someone greater than Jonah is here. So Jonah, Jonah was a messenger of God. Jesus was also a messenger, and right? he came to bring the message of salvation. Um, but uh, Jonah was reluctant, right? He had to be forced. Uh, Jesus was willing. That's one difference. Uh, also, a big difference is that Jesus was not only a messenger of salvation, but he himself is the way of salvation. Um, and so through his death, burial, and resurrection, uh, we can be forgiven of our sins and be saved. And so... So again, we see God's heart uh, for saving wicked people, right? We're all very wicked. Um, when left to ourselves, we, we go our own way. Uh, we don't desire God. Um, you know, we talked about this just last week. Romans 5 says that uh, we're enemies of God. And yet, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Romans chapter 3 says that no one does good. No, no not one. No one seeks God. Um, yeah, we... Uh, um, we are very wicked people, and yet Christ came for our salvation, just like we see God sending Jonah um, to bring salvation, um, or at least a relenting of disaster uh, for the Ninevites. So that's a wonderful thing. Let's pray, and, uh, and then we have the, the great privilege of taking the Lord's Supper this morning, and, uh, and we can further reflect on the salvation that we have in Christ.